أشرف الأعراب والعجم. We talked about the events leading up to uh, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, how he died, and what was the reaction of the companions towards his death, and um, uh, there were some quite detailed questions there on the Facebook page relating to last week's class, and uh, alhamdulillah all those questions have been answered correctly. Jazakumullahu khairan to all those sisters um, who've answered those questions. Well done. So today we'll just go straight into the, another reading from the book and um, this will be the second to last reading, almost finished now. So today we're going to talk about the Prophet's household and then towards the end of the reading uh, something about the character of the Prophet wasallam. Firstly, Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha in Mecca prior to the Hijrah, the migration, the Prophet's household comprised of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his wife Khadija bint Khuwailid. He was 25 years of age and she was 40 when they got married. She was the first woman he married and she was the only wife he had until she died. He had sons and daughters with her. None of their sons lived long, they all died. Their daughters were Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum and Fatima. Zainab was married to her maternal cousin Abu Al-As bin Rabia and that was before the Hijrah migration. Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum were both married to Uthman ibn Affan successively, that is, he married one after the death of her sister. Fatima was married to Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, and that was in the period between Badr and Uhud battles. The sons and daughters that Fatima and Ali had were Al Hassan, Al Hussein, Zainab, and Umm Kulthum. It's well known that the Prophet ﷺ was authorized to have more than four wives for various reasons. The wives he married were 13. Nine of them outlived him. Two died in his lifetime, Khadija and the mother of the poor, Umm al-Masakin, Zainab bint Khuzayma, besides two others with whom he did not consummate his marriage. The second wife, Sauda bint Zam'a, she married, uh, he married her in Shawwal in the tenth year of the Prophethood, a few days after the death of Khadija. Prior to that, she was married to a paternal cousin of hers called As-Sakran bin Amr. Thirdly, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, radiallahu anha, he married her in the eleventh year of the Prophethood, a year after his marriage to Sauda and two years and five months before the Hijra migration. She was six years old when he married her, however, he did not consummate the marriage with her until the month of Shawwal, seven months after the Hijra, and that was in Medina. She was nine then, and she was the only virgin he married, and the most beloved creature to him. As a woman, she was the most learned woman in jurisprudence. Fourth was Hafsa bint Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anha. She was ayin, that is husbandless. Her ex-husband was Khunais bin Hudhafa al-Sahmi in the period between Badr and Uhud battles. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her in the third year after the Hijrah. Fifth was Zainab bint Khuzayma radiallahu anha. She was from Bani Hilal bin Amir bin Sa'sa'a and was nicknamed Umm al-Masakin because of her kindness and care towards the poor people. 
She used to be the wife of Abdullah bin Jahsh, who was martyred at the Battle of Uhud, was married to the Prophet وسلم, in the fourth year of the Hijrah. But she died two or three months after her marriage to the Messenger of Allah. The sixth wife was Umm Salama Hind bint Abi Umayya, and she used to be the wife of Abu Salama, who died in Jumada al Akhir in the fourth year of the Hijrah. Rasulullah married her in the month of Shawwal of the same year. The seventh wife was Zainab bin Jash bin Riyab, and she was from Bani Asad bin Khuzayma and was the messenger's paternal cousin. She was married to Zayd bin Haritha, who was then considered son of the Prophet. However, Zayd divorced her, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down some Quranic verses. In this respect, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلما قضى زيد منها وترا زوجناكها So when Zayd had accomplished his desire from her, that is, he divorced her, we gave her to you in marriage. About her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down some verses of the chapter called Al-Ahzab that discussed the adoption of children in detail. Anyway, we'll discuss this later. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her in the month of Dhul Qa'ada in the fifth year of the Hijrah. The eighth wife was Juwairiya bint al Harith. Al Harith was the head of Bani al Mustalik of Khuza'a. Juwairiya was among the booty that fell to the Muslims from Bani al Mustaliq. And she was a portion of Thabit bin Qais bin Shammas, his Shia. He made her a covenant to set her free in a certain time. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accomplished the covenant and married her in the month of Sha'aban in the sixth Hijri year. The ninth wife was Umm Habiba, Ramla, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. She was married to Ubaidullah bin Jahsh. She migrated with him to Abyssinia. When Ubaidullah apostatized and became a Christian, she stood fast to her religion and refused to convert. However, Ubaidullah died there in Abyssinia. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dispatched Amr bin Umayya at Damri with a letter to the Negus, the king, asking him for Umm Habiba's hand. And that was in the month of Muharram in the seventh year of the Hijrah. The Negus agreed and sent her to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the company of Shurah Bil bin Hasana. Tenth was Safiya bint Huyay bin Akhtab. From the children of Israel, she was among the booty taken at the Khaybar battle. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took her for himself. He set her free and married her after that conquest in the seventh year of the Hijrah. Eleven was Maimuna bint al Harith, the daughter of al Harith and uh, the sister of Umm al Fadl. Lubaba bint al Harith. The Prophet ﷺ married her after the compensatory Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. That was in the month of Dhul Qa'ada, in the seventh year of the Hijrah. They were the eleven women that the Messenger ﷺ had married and consummated marriage with. He outlived two of them, Khadija and Zainab, the Ummul. Masakin, whereas the other nine wives outlived him. The two wives that he did not consummate marriage with were one from Bani Kilab and the other one from Kinda. And this was the one called Al Juniya. Besides these, he had two concubines. The first was Maria, the Coptic, an Egyptian Christian, a gift from Al Muqawqis, the vicegerent of Egypt. She gave birth to his son Ibrahim, who died in Medina while still a child, on the 28th or 29th of the month of Shawwal in the 10th Hijri year, which relates to 27th of January 
632 AD. The second one was Rehana bint Zaid, a Nadriya or Quraidiya, a captive from Bani Quraida. Some people say she was one of his wives. However, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, gives more weight to the first version. Abu Ubaidah spoke of two more concubines, Jamila, a captive, and another one, a bondwoman, granted to him by Zainab bin Jash. Whosoever meditates on the life of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will conceive that his marriage to this number of women in the late years of his lifetime, after he had spent almost 30 years of the best days of his youth, sufficing himself to one older wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, and later on to Solda, was in no way an overwhelming lustful desire to be satisfied through such a number of wives. These marriages were in fact motivated by aims and purposes much more glorious and greater than normal marriages usually aim at. The tendency of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam towards establishing a relationship by marriage with both Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma and his marriage to Aisha and Hafsa and getting his daughter Fatima married to Ali bin Abi Talib and the marriage of his two daughters Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum to Uthman indicate clearly that he aimed at confirming the relationship among the four men whose sacrifices and great achievements in the cause of Islam are well known. Besides this, there was that tradition of the Arabs to honor the in-law relations. For them, a son or a daughter-in-law was a means by which they sought the consolidation of relationship and affection with various clans. Hostility and fights against alliances and affinities would bring an unforgettable shame, disgrace and degradation to them. By marrying the mothers of believers, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to demolish or break down the Arab tribe's enmity to Islam and extinguish their intense hatred. Um Salama was from Bani Makhzum, the clan of Abu Jahl and Khalid ibn Walid. Her marriage to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, produced good results. Khalid's deliberately undecisive attitude at Uhud, for instance, was due to the Messenger's marriage to Um Salama. Khalid went even further than that. In a short time, he willingly became a keen, obedient Muslim. And after the Messenger of Allah وسلم, marriage to Um Habiba, Abu Sufyan, her father, did not show him any sort of hostility. Similarly, his marriage to Juwairiya and Safiya made the two tribes stop all sorts of provocation, aggression, or hostility against Islam. Better still, Juwairiya herself was one of the greatest sources of blessing to her own people. On the occasion of the marriage to the Prophet ﷺ, his companions set a hundred families of her people free. They said, it is for their affinity with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No need to say what a great impression this gratitude had on everybody's soul. One of the greatest motives of all is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's bidding his Prophet to educate and purify the souls of people who had known nothing whatsoever about courtesy, education and culture. He had to teach them to comply with the necessities of civilization and to contribute to the solidification and the establishment of a new Islamic society. An essential fundamental rule of the Muslim society is to prohibit mixing of men and women. Providing direct education for women, though highly compelling, is impossible in the light of this Islamic norm. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ had to select some women of different ages and talents and indoctrinate them systematically in order to educate women Bedouins and townswomen, old and young, and thus furnish them with the instruments of propagating the true faith. The mothers of believers, that is the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, were in such a convenient position that they could convey the state of the Prophet and his affairs 
to people, men and women. Being educated and taught the teachings and rules of Islam, his wives, especially those who outlived him, played a very important role in conveying prophetic traditions or a hadith to the Muslims. Aisha radiallahu anha, for instance, related a large number of the Prophet's deeds and statements. His marriage to his paternal cousin Zainab bin Jash was a peculiar case which aimed at eradicating a deeply rooted pre-Islamic tradition that is the adoption of children. In Jahiliya, the Arabs used to consider an adopted person exactly like a real son or daughter as far as rights and sanctities are concerned. That Jahiliya tradition had been so deeply rooted in their hearts that it wasn't easy to remove or uproot it. This tradition, in fact, affronts the basic principles of Islam, especially those concerned with marriage, divorce and inheritance, and some other cases, and brought about lots of corruption and indecency. Naturally, Islam stands against such deeds, and it attempts to remove them from the Islamic society. For the eradication of this tradition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bid his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to marry his cousin Zainab bint Jash, who was an ex-wife to Zaid. She was at variance with Zaid to the extent that he intended to divorce her. That was the time when the confederates al Ahzab were making an evil alliance against the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and against the Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feared that the hypocrites, the idolaters and the Jews would make propaganda out of it and try to influence some Muslims of weak hearts. And that was why he urged Zaid not to divorce her in order to not get involved in that trial. Undoubtedly this hesitation and partiality were alien to the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not apply to the power of determination and will with which he had been sent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blamed him for that by saying, and remember, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you said to the one on whom Allah Ta'ala bestowed favor, and you bestowed favor, keep your wife in fear Allah Ta'ala, while you concealed within yourself that which Allah Ta'ala is to disclose. And you fear the people while Allah Ta'ala has more right to has more right that you fear him. Finally, Zaid divorced Zainab and Rasulullah married her at the time he laid siege to Bani Qubayda. And that was after she had fin finished her idda, the period during which a widow or a divorcee may not remarry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself had already ordained it and so gave him no other alternative. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had even started the marriage himself by saying, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَتَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَ هَا لِكَيْ لَا يَكُقْنَا عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ إِذَا قَضَوَ مِنْهُمْ وَطَرَى So when Zayd had no longer any need for her, we married her to you in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them and ever is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accomplished. And that was in order to break down the tradition of child adoption in practice after he had done it in words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran وَدَعُوهُمَا لِآبَائِهِمَّ هُوَ أَقْصَةُ وَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ 
call them adopted sons by the names of their fathers. That is more just near Allah Ta'ala. Also, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِرِّدٍ مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the last of the end of the prophets. Lots of deeply rooted traditions cannot be uprooted or even adjusted by mere words. They must be matched and associated with the action of the advocate of the message himself. Some companions would even race to the water that fell down from the Prophet ﷺ from his ablution, and they almost quarreled for it. There were others who competed to pledge allegiance to death, and some others pledged not to flee from the battlefield. Among those people were eminent companions like Omar and Abu Bakr who although dedicated all their lives to the Prophet وسلم, and to the cause of Islam but refused to carry out the messenger's orders with respect to slaughtering sacrificial animals after the ratification of al hudaybiyah peace treaty which was a source of anxiety for the Prophet وسلم. However, when Umm Salama radiallahu anha advised that he take the initiative and sacrifice his animals. His followers raced to follow his example. The clear evidence and support of the saying, actions speak louder than words in the process of exterminating a deeply established tradition. The hypocrites aroused a lot of suspicions and made broad false propaganda against that marriage. Their acts and talks about that marriage had ill effects on those Muslims whose faith was still weak, particularly that Zainab was the fifth wife, and the Noble Qur'an limited the number up to four only. Zaid was traditionally his son, and so a father marrying his son's divorcee was a heinous sin in the eyes of the Arabians. Al Ahzab Surah was revealed to full shed light on the two issues. That is, Islam does not recognize adoption of children. And the Prophet وسلم, is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more freedom as regards the number of wives he can hold than other Muslims in order to achieve noble and honorable purposes. However, the treatment of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to his wives was of honorable, noble, and superb nature. His wives were favored in respect of honor, satisfaction, patience, modesty, and service. That is to say, the performance of housework and marriage duties. Although the Messenger's house life was hard and unbearable, none of his wives complained. Anas radiallahu an, who said about the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to my knowledge, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has never tasted a thin, flattened loaf in all his lifetime, nor has he ever seen with his own eyes roasted mutton. Aisha radiallahu anha said, over two months have elapsed, during which we have seen three crescents. And yet no fire has been kindled in the houses of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is, they did not cook food. What did you eat to sustain yourselves? Arwa asked. And she said, the two blacks, dates and water. Lots of information about the hard life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told. In spite of these hardships, straits and adversity of life in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, None of his wives uttered a word of complaint worthy of reproach, except but once. And this was required by human instinctive inclinations. However, it was not so important, and consequently it did not require the decree of a legislative rule. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them an opportunity to choose between two things, as clearly stated in the following verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Qur'an, 
يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك إن كنتم تبدن الحياة الدنيا وزينتها فتعالينا أمتعكن وأصرحكن سراحا جميلا وإن كنتم تبدن الله ورسوله والدار الآخرة فإن الله أعد للمحسنات منكن أجرا عظيما O Prophet say to your wives If you should desire the worldly life and its adornment then come I will provide for you and give you a gracious release But if you should desire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger and the home of the hereafter, then indeed Allah Ta'ala has prepared for the doers of good among you a great reward. They were so noble and honest that none of them preferred the life of this world and its glitter to the abode in the hereafter. Although there were many in number, nothing of the disputes that normally happen among co-wives took place in their houses. There were very few cases as the only exception, but they were quite normal, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approached them for that, so they ceased to do such a thing. This incident is mentioned in Surah at tahrim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu alima tu haqqimu ma ahanallahu lak. O Prophet, why do you ban for yourself that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made lawful to you? The Prophet ﷺ, his attributes and manners. The Prophet ﷺ combined both perfection of creation and perfection of manners. This impression on people can be deduced by the bliss that overwhelmed their hearts and filled them with dignity. Men's dignity, devotion and estimation of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ were unique and matchless. No other man in the whole world has been so honoured and beloved. Those who knew him well were fascinated and enchanted by him. They were ready to sacrifice their lives for the sake of saving a nail of his from hurt or injury, being privileged with perfection that no one else had been endowed with. His companions found that he was peerless, and so they loved him. And here we list a brief summary of the versions about his beauty and perfection. Describing the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who passed by her tent on his journey of migration, Umm Abad al Khuzaiya said to her husband, He was innocently bright and had broad appearance. His manners were fine. Neither was his belly bulging out nor was his head deprived of hair. He had black, attractive eyes, finely arched by continuous eyebrows. His hair glossy and black, inclined to curl, was long. His voice was extremely commanding. His head was large, well-formed and set on a slender neck. His expression was pensive and contemplative, serene and sublime. The stranger was fascinated from the distance, but no sooner he became intimate with him than his fascination was changed into attachment and respect. His expression was very sweet and distinct. His speech was well set and free from the use of superfluous words, as if it were a rosary of beads. His stature was neither too high nor too small to look repulsive. He was a twig amongst the two. Singularly bright and fresh, he was always surrounded by his companions. Whenever he uttered something, the listeners would hear him with rapt attention and whenever he issued any command, they vied with each other in carrying it out. He was a master and a commander. His utterances were marked by truth and sincerity, free from all kinds of falsehoods and lies. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu describing him said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was neither excessively tall nor extremely short. He was medium height among his friends. His hair was neither curly nor wavy. It was in between. It was not too curly, nor was it plain straight. It was both curly and wavy combined. His, his face was not swollen or compact. It was fairly round, and his mouth was white. 
He had black and large eyes with long eyelids. His joints and limbs and shoulder joints were rather big. He had little hair extending from his chest down to his navel, but the rest of his body was almost hairless. He had thick hand palms and thick fingers and toes. At walking, he lifted his feet off the ground as if he had been walking in the muddy rema remainder of water. When he turned, he turned all. The prophethood seal was between his shoulders. He is the seal of the prophets, the most generous and the bravest of all. His speech was the most reliable. He was the keenest and the most attentive to people's trust, and he was very careful to pay people's due in full. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the most tractable and the most yielding companion. Seeing him unexpectedly, you fear him and venerate him. He who has acquaintance with him will like him. He who describes him says, I've never seen such a person neither before nor after seeing him. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Okay, so that concludes our reading for today from the book, The Sealed Nectar. أشرف الأعراف